This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Calling all Kentucky kids. It's time to think summer, and with that comes Fish and Wildlife Conservation Camp, a tradition that dates back for generations and is still the highlight of the summer break. It's a hands-on, minds-on, feet-wet week, you've heard said, learning about water, wildlife, and a little about yourself. We go inside outdoors with conservation educator Gary Rogers, and we'll talk about what makes this a week that lasts a lifetime. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The Natural Tax Shelter. When I'm 15, I'm going to be prom queen. When I'm 15, I'm going to have my own limo and private jet. 15 is a good year. Just ask Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. To honor our 15th anniversary of elk hunting, the new Pick 4 option doubles your chance to take home a trophy. When I'm 15, I'm going elk hunting. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Is 2015 your lucky number? Get your elk permit and dream big. SW.KY.GOV. You are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Charlie Baglin. Did you go to camp when you were a kid? I did. And summer camps tend to serve a couple of different purposes. One, it gives your parents a much-needed break. Two, it's a good learning opportunity for children. They learn to take care of themselves, make some decisions on their own. Could be the first time they are away from home for any length of time. Today we are talking about Kentucky Conservation Camps, sponsored, of course, by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. There are three of these around the state. Camp Webb, that's over near Grayson in eastern Kentucky. In western end of the state, we have Camp Curry, and down in south central on Lake Cumberland, it's Camp Earl Wallace. And my guest today is the assistant director of that camp, Gary Rogers. And hello, Mr. Rogers. (laughs) I guess you... Have to be an old camper to understand that reference. Uh, I've had old students because I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I used to walk in the classroom and they would all break into the Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Song. Really? And now I don't think kids probably know who Mr. Rogers is anymore, so that's probably good for me. So when did that stop? I bet it stopped 15 years ago. There's too many other television programs now kids watch, so Mr. Rogers, I guess, went the way of the dodo. Conservation so. camp. In Kentucky, you told me a little while ago, you'd been doing this since 1983. That's true. I worked at conservation camp for two years when I was in college, and then I've been permanently at conservation camp for 28 summers. So I have 30 total years of conservation camp being down there in the summertime. So you are what, 20, 22? How old are you? Uh, a little older than 22. <laughs> you, are, you are permanently 22. I am stuck in the 80s, I guess. So, conservation camp, because it's been going on since, what, 1940, what was that? I believe they opened Camp Curry, if I'm not mistaken, in 1948, but I could be wrong. It's been a, like a rite of passage. We're like three generations now. Yeah, my dad did it. My father's father did it. That type of thing. You want to see your son, your daughter do this. Go to conservation camp and uh, learn everything there is about the outdoors. I know that my kids all three went to Fish and Wildlife Camp when they were the right grades to go to camp. And uh, at this point, I'm taking people's kids to camp that I took to camp when they were kids. So I have teachers in school that tell me I took them to camp when they were children. It keeps you young. You don't mind being a part of summer camp because that's your life. That's your family there, despite the fact you're married with three children. 
It's the greatest job in the world. I always tell people, I've never gone to work a single day where I didn't like to get up and go to work. Whether it's teaching school during the school year that I do for Fish and Wildlife, or going to camp and hanging out with these kids, because it's the kids that are 9, 10, 11, 12 years old at camp are great. The counselors are college students. They're great. And as long as you hang out with people that are younger than you, it seems like you just don't get old. Or I don't at least act old. My wife says I act like I'm 13. Nothing wrong with 13. I'm stuck at 13, (laughs) I guess. In the years that you've been doing this, and I would suspect that when people hear this, they know what it means to have a conservation officer come to their school and teach something about fish, wildlife, or nature. That's something that kids would look forward to. That's what people now for 50, 60, 70 years have enjoyed. Have you seen many changes in your tenure? Things for me really haven't changed at all. In in almost 29 school years, kids still love to see you come in the classroom and talk about animals and goofy stories about things I did growing up and how I survived some of the dumb stuff I did in the woods and and they just want to they want to hear about animals and nature and and people shooting guns and just all kind of outdoor things because you don't get that in school very much. Most school teachers in college they don't learn about wildlife and nature when you're studying to be a math teacher or English teacher or history teacher. So who's going to teach these kids stuff about the outdoors if we don't do it? Because a lot of these kids, they don't have a parent at home that does it anymore either. Yeah. So this is their one chance to learn about nature. When they go to camp, it's, it opens the door to go out and actually go fishing and go shoot a gun and learn about nature and hike in the woods. And maybe they'll go home so enthused about that that they'll talk their parents into going out with them and buying a bow so they can go shoot archery and maybe they'll eventually learn to go bow hunting because they like archery so much or fish with mom and dad and maybe make a fishing person out of mom and dad and grandma and grandpa so it is a huge benefit and it hasn't changed at all for me in all those years kids like that stuff and they want to do that stuff so you're saying that kids like that stuff even though they're not exposed to it as they were let's say when you were now little boys no, nah, when we grew up, of course, I, I didn't grow up in the city. I grew up in the in the boonies there, so we could walk down the driveway to the creek and go fishing if we wanted to, and you could walk out in the backyard and shoot a gun. So they don't have maybe the access that we had. And in, in a lot of the, some of them do. I teach in a lot of counties. I'm in all of central Kentucky. So the kids that are out in, in rural Anderson County and Mercer County and Franklin County, they get to go out and do a lot more of this stuff. But the kids I have in Fayette County, that's a whole different clientele, and it may be something they would never have gotten to do if they hadn't gone with me to camp in the summer. Kids live in a digital world today. We all live in a digital world. If we don't have an iPad or an iPhone or a Droid or something, computer in front of us, you know, we're lost. Camp is a good place to unplug because we don't have that at camp. It's not computer camp. It's not play with your device camp. It's go out and do things outside like I grew up doing things outside, and I think that's good for kids. You need to get away from some of the screens and staring at games all day on the TV set. So you're saying you cannot have a phone with you at camp? Is there Wi-Fi or a cell signal there? A very weak cell signal. We don't have a cell phone tower taped to a tree down in the middle of the woods in southeastern Kentucky or Camp Webb or Camp Curry, but... There is no cell phones. It's a safety issue at camp because we don't know who's trying to contact a child if they have a cell phone. Because of cyberbullying, somebody with cell phones, they all take pictures now. I don't want somebody taking a picture of me, changing into my pajamas, and I'm sure most campers don't want that picture taken either and post it online later on. So almost no camp allows cell phones that I've ever heard of because of that. And the main reason you really don't want to have a phone, if you take a phone to camp and you call home every night, uh, you never get a chance to grow up. Camp exists, really, so kids will find out it's okay to be away from home for four nights, away from mom and grandma and dad or grandpa or whoever you live with, and it's not going to be the end of the world if you don't get to talk to them every night. You're in a safe place where you're learning stuff and you're being observed by the staff. We know everybody's happy and safe, so there's no reason to call home. If you call home every night, you're going to be the kid that lives at home in the basement when you're 40 years old. That makes a lot of sense, but if I were 12, I'd find a way to stick my phone in there. At some point, 
you are going to see this bright little screen somewhere buried in a sleeping bag as it's bedtime. Are you not? Uh, we do, and then we just tell them we have to keep the phones in the office because it's a security issue and everything else. It's it's on all the paperwork the parents sign to send them to camp and everything else. They agree that they will not send a anything that can get an internet signal or a phone signal to camp with the kid. And it's it's like I said, it's a safety issue. They just can't have them at camp. It's just the rules. Kids have to learn that there's rules too. And if a parent wants to sneak a phone in with the kid, knowing it's against the rules, it's kind of teaching the kid right off. It's it's okay to break rules. So. Well, I will agree with that. But, again, I'm not 12. But I, I agree with the rules, and I hope that it works. It's only for five days, right. five years, if you're without your phone. But it's only five days. We will have more on conservation camps when we come back. We're talking to Gary Rogers. My name is Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Field Radio. Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and our subject today is conservation education. The Summer Conservation Camp Program also is a part of the show, and all this is nothing new. Gary Rogers is my guest, and he is one of the senior conservation educators in the state. That's a, a modern term. Uh, 50 years ago, it was conservation officer because when I was a child, only the conservation officer, the law enforcement officers, taught conservation. Okay. And they would teach conservation and they would teach school. When I started teaching conservation in school, we still did, and I'm the only one left who still did law enforcement and taught school. I would go out with officers in the evenings and on the weekends and chase coon hunters through the woods and watch for spotlighters and things and but the law enforcement this these days is uh a lot more involved than it used to be and it's better to have a separate division for law enforcement and a separate division for education so they can do their job and they do it well and we can do our job and do it well and not have to worry about i can't teach class on monday because i have to be in court because i write somebody a ticket and i have to be there in front of the judge so fish and wildlife is just a different animal than it was 50 years ago it's a lot bigger there's a lot more things to deal with than we used to have to deal with what do you teach is what you teach at summer conservation camp an extension of what has been taught all year at school in a way if you have conservation with me in school i will touch on certain wildlife topics that you might see this at camp you might learn this at camp we certainly talk about gun safety during the school year and they get to actually do the orange card gun safety class at camp so that helps but if you never had conservation in your school you would still enjoy camp you would still get the same thing out of camp as everybody else so tell me what then what do you teach at camp at camp there are seven activities we have archery and we have gun safety nature outdoor survival swimming casting and fishing and motorboating and canoeing a lot of those things are pretty self-explanatory except for nature what all is involved in that nature we they learn a lot about wildlife and what lives outside what you might see in the woods when you're outside in the woods and parts of the nature activity are things you need to learn for the kentucky hunter education course card also So gun safety. I don't want my kid playing with a gun. So tell me why he or she isn't playing, in quotes, with a gun. At camp, you're not playing with a gun because you're being observed by four adults. You're shooting on a shooting range. It's a shooting table. Eight kids at a time under our supervision are learning to shoot properly. You have to learn everything about a gun at gun safety at camp we do a lecture like you would learn in any school we do a lecture telling them how to carry a gun how to load a gun how to cross fences and ditches and logs and what's a safe shot what's not a safe shot all about backstops and then we teach them how to load and aim and fire a gun correctly and mainly this would be for target shooting or hunting it's not to be a thug on the street no we don't have any car doors you shoot a gun out of sideways or anything on the shooting range (laughs) the supervisory aspect of what goes on at camp and and what goes on at gun safety it isn't this limited to gun safety it might be there at school or at the swimming pool archery even at dinner 
you've got a lot of staff there to make sure it's done right. That's true. Each week of camp is up to 208 campers, 104 boys, 104 girls, and they're divided into cabins of 26. And each cabin has two counselors responsible for that cabin. There are 21 college students that we hire, screen, and train before camp, and they're a permanent staff for the entire summer. We don't have any volunteers at camp. Everybody has to be checked by the Kentucky State Police background check, Cabinet for Children background check. We hire four adult supervisors. We call them counselor supervisors. They're usually school teachers that aren't working during the summer to help assist us to observe the college students and help us teach activities. And there are six or seven conservation educators at camp during the summer as well. So it's a big staff of people for that many kids. I think the ratio is one adult per every six campers. So to deal with the things that kids are dealing with, uh, homesickness, for example, is there any special training that comes for that, how to deal specifically with a child? We go through so many trainings before camp starts. We're there way before the kids ever get there in the summer with our staff, and you have to learn how to deal with kids on a kid level and and I mean first aid and and bullying and just a whole gamut of subjects you got to learn about cuz a lot of people really don't deal with kids you know besides being a kid you never deal with kids again your whole life if you're a college student the last time you hung out with a little kid was when you were in the 5th grade yeah so you got to yeah. teach them how yeah. kids think and kids things like Little kids don't understand sarcasm. It's they they think you're being serious all the time. A lot of them, and so you got to teach somebody that you can't really be sarcastic around a lot of these kids because they'll take to heart what you say, and you don't want to hurt their feelings thinking you're being funny. It's just the littlest thing. So there's a lot of training goes into dealing with kids. Primary, I'm reading here the mission statement for conservation education. We are the primary, and we being the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, and people like you, and you exist to develop and enhance awareness, knowledge, skills, commitment that will enable people, meaning these little kids, to make informed decisions that will result in responsible behavior. What's that mean in a, in a few words? I think we want to make them responsible in the outdoors, responsible people that understand why we have a Department of Fish and Wildlife and why we have hunting season, why we do the things we do. What's an example of an informed decision that a child may not be able to grow up and make on their own without your intervention? Some people will grow up in a house where people will just tell them that it's evil to hunt, it's evil to catch fish, and need to learn to make up your mind for yourself sometimes whether something is actually a good thing or a bad thing camps changed since they came on board? Have you added new things? The program Take- itself isn't a whole lot different. You're still learning the same basic skills at camp, except we've replaced the old rowboats with canoes because a lot more people think it's fun to canoe. We have air conditioning in the cabins in the cafeteria. Other than that, uh, camp is really still the same outdoor adventure for five days that people got when they went to Camp Wallace that I work at in 1952. You're still learning outdoor skills. Now, I will tell you, we we don't do a lot of carving and whittling with knives and chopping things up with an axe like we used to because that's not really a skill that most people use anymore anyway. You have a sheet in front of you. Officer Rogers, Venture Camp. What's that mean? Okay, well, most of our camp, if you go to Camp Curry, Camp Wallace, Camp Webb, it's grade 4, 5, and 6. If you're in grade 4, 5, and 6 this school year, you're eligible to go to camp. People would ask, well, what do you do for older kids? Because you kind of lose them after the sixth grade. So they decided that it might be fun if we tried something new last year, seventh and eighth grade camp. It's mostly geared for kids who went to Camp Wallace or Camp Webb or Camp Curry in the 4th, 5th, or 6th grade, but you don't necessarily have to have gone then. And it's just advanced camp. You can earn your bow hunter education card. You have a lot more involved training in archery, and, and the skills and things you do might be a little more advanced. 
than, than the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade camp. So it's a chance to go back to camp for another couple of years. If you really loved it, go back to camp in seventh and eighth grade and get more of it. So this is for seventh graders and eighth graders. Right. And uh, the difference is, the, a big difference is, if you're in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade and you sign up for camp, you get a letter in the middle of May telling you where to meet the bus. And it's usually in your county or a neighboring county. For Venture Camp, there are only three spots that you would go to meet a bus because it's a kind of a different ball game here. So you would meet a bus either in Kenton County or Jefferson County or Fayette County. So whichever one you live closest to, you would go and be dropped off on Monday at that bus stop. And then they would drop you back off at that same bus stop on Friday to be picked up and go home. Because all of Venture Camp is at Camp Webb. July 27th to the 31st this summer. So if I'm in Paducah or Fulton, that's a pretty good haul. That's it what a, a five, six, seven hour drive to. It's a pretty good trip to get know. there. So you got a day on each end of it, just just to get there and go home. I'd say if you're coming from the far end of the realm there, it's going to take you a pretty good part of your day to get to camp. One thing a lot of people may not realize about camp, if you're looking around for a place to send your kids to have a good camping experience this summer, is that Fish and Wildlife Conservation Camps offer transportation. That's unusual. Normally you got to pack the kid up and all their stuff and haul them somewhere and then go get them. That's the beauty of Fish and Wildlife Camp is that uh, for your fee, which if you apply online, which is the preferred way to apply, it's only $225. That pays for your transportation from your area to camp and back. It pays for all your meals the entire week. It pays for all of our equipment that you're using. It pays for living in the air-conditioned cabin. It pays for the professional instructors that you have all week long teaching you the skills. That's an incredible five-day vacation for $225. You can't. You can't beat it. Anyone who travels, you cannot beat that kind of deal. More on giving Kentucky kids some nature know-how. Gary Rogers will stay with us through the break. We'll also have a fishing report just ahead. I'm Charlie Baglin, and you are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. And this is one of those shows that you probably have a friend who would like to hear this, to know more about fish and wildlife conservation camps. Maybe they live on Ken Lake or have a young son or daughter in eastern Kentucky that really like this sort of thing. You can find our show on YouTube. Just go in, put in Kentucky Field Radio, myhuntingandfishing.com, as well as we are a podcast on iTunes. So look for us, Kentucky Field Radio. We'll have more, but first up, our fishing report. <laughs> In western Kentucky, down on Kentucky and Barker Lakes, it's getting ready to be fishing season. The sun has come out, the water temperatures are starting to rise into the low 50s, and so it's getting that time of the year when the crappie are going to start moving up shallow. So this is a good time to start fishing the adjacent flats next to the creek channels. The crappie will be somewhat suspended, but you can do kind of a slow troll. Some people have a drift sock and they just get out there and they drift in those flats. It looks like we're going to have a good crappie season. As far as bass, a lot of fish being taken on rocky points at the mouths of the embayments. So I'd fish around the mouths and on the sides where there's some rocky shoreline just inside the embayments using spinner baits, rattle traps, jerk baits, and crank baits. Kind of seems like the big baits right now to be using. Well, this is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central District Fishing Report. Currently, water conditions are either flooding or a lot of the lakes are very high, especially the reservoirs. However, many of our small lakes are in good condition. This is a great time of year to get out and try to catch some largemouth bass. Largemouth are moving into shallow water in preparation for the spawn. And this time of year actually provides an excellent opportunity to catch a quality or even a trophy-sized largemouth bass at this time. 
you can catch a lot of these big fish at your local farm ponds. But you may want to try using jigs or plastic creature baits uh, around shoreline cover. Also, large crankbaits and jerk baits are additional baits that are excellent this time of year. Hope to see you on the water. This is Rob Rolls in the Northwestern Fishery District with a fishing update for our area. Currently, our major reservoirs, Rough River Lake and Nolan River Lake, are both 10 feet over summer pool. If you're going to go after walleye in the next week or so, you need to go way on upriver above the Broad Ford area. Hybrid striped bass at Rough River Lake. Uh, anytime the lake gets up and parking lots get flooded, anglers do really well fishing night crawlers on some of the flooded parking lots. So if you're around Rough River Lake, it'd be a good time to give that a try. Don't forget our Fins Lakes in the Owensboro, Madisonville, and Litchfield area. We're going to have a lot of two to five pound fish in the Fins Lake stockings. So this will be an excellent time to get out and hit the Fins Lakes that are near you. That's an update from the Northwestern Fishery District. Always wear your PA. Especially when the water temperatures are this cool. Summer camp means it's time for focus, if that's on band, chess, soccer. But at conservation camp, the focus is the magic of nature. More after the break. When I'm 15, I'm going to be prom queen. When I'm 15, I'm going to have my own limo and private jet. 15 is a good year. Just ask Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. To honor our 15th anniversary of elk hunting, the new Pick 4 option doubles your chance to take home a trophy. When I'm 15, I'm going elk hunting. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Is 2015 your lucky number? Get your elk permit and dream big. And W.K.Y.Gov. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund, the natural tax shelter. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. If you are just joining us, I'm talking to Gary Rogers. He is one of several conservation educators across Kentucky. He visits classrooms to teach kids the wonders of nature. Now, this program has touched, I'm going to say, most of the people that grew up in Kentucky. It's a program of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's been around since the 1940s. I remember it as a kid. It's a program that's still alive and well, and kids love it. An extension of the conservation education program is the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Camp held every summer. It's a hands-on, minds-on, feet-wet week for kids fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Three conservation camps across Kentucky. Collectively, these camps reach 4,500 kids every summer. And if you're planning on going, it's time to register now for summer camp. Mr. Rogers, I'm trusting that part of the adventure of camp is uh, getting to the bus to go to camp. You need to be there on time because the bus won't wait on you on Monday either. If we say we're leaving on Monday at 8 o'clock, we're leaving at 8 o'clock. So you need to be there by 7.15. So camp teaches you punctuality. If you don't have punctuality, make sure your parents have punctuality because if you're late, it's a long yeah. walk to camp. I have always believed in not being late. Always. And if somebody runs late, well, you missed the boat, or you missed the airplane, exactly. or you missed yeah. the meal. You missed something. Exactly. You don't run late. What do you do if somebody calls, hey, I'm running late? I will tell them that you can catch me at the bathroom break outside of Somerset, because yeah. I can't make 207 kids sit on the bus and wait for one person to show up late. So yeah. on time is the way I run my ship. So camping season is coming up. When is the first week of camp? When does it start? Uh, because of so many snow days, first week of camp has now been moved. Whatever counties went, the first week of June are now going, uh, I think, the first week of July or of August, I'm sorry, because... And camp. it never snows at summer camp. It doesn't know snow that. at summer camp, but snow sure messes up summer camp sometimes. Yeah. Kids, do they have to have attended your class or the conservation education class, wherever the school is in the state? Do they have to be a part of that? to be eligible for camp? They do not. 
it used to be that way. Now, a lot of parents that went when they were kids are still thinking the old ways, and they said, well, you can't go to camp because you don't have Mr. Rogers in school. I can't go to every school. I've got eight counties, and there's one of me, and I don't know how many schools are in those eight counties, but I can't be everywhere. So if your school doesn't have Fish and Wildlife Conservation class, you are more than welcome to sign up online for camp. You get on the fw.ky.gov website, find the education part. You can fill an application out online, pay for it online, and then print off a health history form and mail it back to my Lexington address. And you can go to camp like everybody else. So there, there's no disadvantage of not having your class. It's just maybe a benefit less, to go. You just get less of me, but uh, <laughs> you miss the glorious me. But otherwise, no, you're not missing out anything by not having conservation class. So then to register, it's best to do that on the Internet. Right. Almost everybody. It's it's an online world. Everybody shops online for Christmas and birthdays right. and Hanukkah and everything else. So we're not really doing checks anymore because sending checks in the mail and then I have to take all the information and put it in this system for you. And I have to take your check and i got to take your check to Frankfurt. And by the time all that gets done, camp might be full. So if you register online, you have your spot as soon as you've paid for it, and then you mail this health history form back to me. You're you're in that spot as long as it lets you apply. Now, what people are going to find out in certain areas pretty soon is you get online and you type in your county, and it'll say only accepting boys at this time or only accepting girls at this time or and not accepting either one at this time because you waited too long and camp is filled. Some weeks are, are a lot more filled than other weeks at this point. So you don't want to wait forever. On the application, it says apply before April 15th. That's a pretty good rule to live by. If you wait until after April 15th, you might try to apply for camp and find out that it tells you to be on the waiting list. Do you have your pick of any week you want, or how's that work? You are supposed to go in the week that is assigned to your county. It's helpful to know that going into this so you can plan any other summer stuff, vacations, right, uh, around that week of camp. Now, if you're in Jefferson County, they have several different weeks of camp from Jefferson County, depending on who your conservation educator is in your area. So sometimes different schools from the same county are assigned different weeks. And it's... Uh, that's above me how they plan out who goes where or who gets what week because I don't deal with Jefferson County personally. But there's three different educators that deal with Jefferson County, so they all have their weeks assigned. So go on there and look. Now, that web address is FW, standing for Fish Wildlife, dot KY dot gov. You'll yep. find it under that education tab, I trust. If you just get on the Fish and Wildlife homepage, you would be able to find it on there somewhere, too. And you, yeah. But if you go into fw.ky.gov, at the top of the page, I think you would click on Education, and it brings down a list of choices, and one of them would be Begin Online Registration for Camp. So it, you just go through several pages of filling out information, pay for it at the end, print off a health history form, and mail it back to the educator whose name is at the bottom and you're good to go. Just wait for your travel arrangements to show up in the middle of May. Now we were talking about you've been doing this since 1983, yet you're 22 years old. What's so, kept you 22? Good genes. Since I've known you, <laughs> since I've known you, you've ridden a bike practically everywhere you've gone. I've been racing bicycles for 28 years. So if you want to stay in a young man's job, you better stay like a young man. So if I get old and unhealthy, then I, I think that you can't really relate to kids as well. If you look like some old doddering dude that comes into the classroom, then you're just some old grandpa dude nobody wants to listen to. You look you, like me. Well, I don't know about that. but uh, true, It's true. But you ride bikes, and you're in races. You don't do this just uh, for fun. This is serious. You told me you had 12 high-end bicycles right i do don't tell my wife and uh there are different kinds of racing bikes i have ones for every discipline of bike racing i belong to a team out of somerset called southern performance and um we travel around and race in different states could you do the tour de france are you that caliber 
No. Could you do it and come in last? I could ride the tour. Okay, so you're not quite... With the calendar. You're, you're not the, the Greg LeMonds of I the world not. that we know of. I'm the same age as Greg LeMond, but I am not Greg LeMond. I've had my moments, but uh, at 53 years old, I think the young boys would pretty much spank me now. So what's funner, a road bike or mountain bike? That's a good question. I like both. I like the mountain bike because I like to be out in the woods. There's no better way to sneak up on a deer than riding a mountain bike down a trail. But I like road biking because you're going faster. It's like flying without wings, I guess. So how fast will a, a bicyclist go? Uh, on an average training ride, I'll never go out and ride less than 20 miles a day. That's just it's not worth it to go out for less than 20 miles. And I would probably average on a training day maybe 17, 18, 19 miles an hour. I have been on a bicycle going 70 miles an hour down the side of a mountain, which is incredibly scary, and I would never do that again, but um, there's no airbag on a, on a bicycle, so you don't really want to do that if you can help it. Speaking of that, then, you've had to take a few tumbles. I have been broken up pretty bad at many occasions. Did you get any video of it where you're wearing a GoPro at the time? Uh, no, but that was on a television camera. I was in a race in West Virginia. I hit a tree and ripped my shorts off. And there was a man standing over me with a television camera. And I was trying to inform him that none of that could be put on television because I was just wearing a shirt. And he didn't seem like he wanted to stop filming. So, But was the bike hurt? Was the bike okay? That's the first thing you ask when you get up is, how's my bike? Because <laughs> a bike is an investment of thousands of dollars. It's things like that that keep a person young and alive and energetic. And you, you mentioned you like to dry, ride a mountain bike through the woods for the nature aspect. You get to see deer sneak up on things. It is. It's cool. And at camp, I ride my bike at summer camp every morning. At the crack of dawn, I get up and ride before camp starts. And I see amazing wildlife outside of Monticello. I ride up on bobcats and families of foxes. Uh, the occasional skunk that hasn't gone to bed yet, and uh, possums walking down the side of the road. You see all the neat birds of prey sitting on the trees on the side of the road. So it's 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 great down there because it's a lot different than riding a bike in Lexington. <laughs> You've got some hills because like, that camp, Camp Earl Wallace, sort of sits down close to the water, and so you got a little valley to go down in there. Right. If you if you are at camp, you should be prepared to do a lot of walking, and a lot of that walking is going to be up and down hills. It don't take your flip flop sandals or Crocs. Leave them at home. It's nothing but Blister City. You need real actual shoes you can walk in if you're going to go to camp. If you're going to ride a bike, you better be ready to ride a bike up and down a big hill when you live down there because it's all hills. But they can't take a bike, can they? They couldn't take a bike. They wouldn't want to try taking a bike down that hill anyway. But you take a bike and you'll get out and ride for what, an hour? I try to ride in the summer in the mornings at least two hours. So I'm trying to put in 40 miles, um, and that's not touching what some people ride. In a week, a lot of guys in the, the meat of the season will ride a bike 300, 400 miles a week. I'm lucky if I get 200 miles a week. Well, no need to put yourself down. You know, there's some people who want to do maybe two miles. I go to the YMCA if you do two miles, hey. Yeah. You're, you're busting a good one. I can remember how much of a thrill it was the first time I got up to 20 miles. I thought I'd really done something. Conservation camp is the subject. Still a few minutes to go with cyclist and conservation educator Gary Rogers, so stay with us. My name is Charlie Bagman, and you are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. back with our final few on Kentucky Field Radio. My name's Charlie Baglin, and if I'm bouncing around watching TV, flipping through the channels, and I come across a Tom and Jerry cartoon, maybe a Bugs Bunny or Flintstones, I watch it, and I don't just watch it as an adult. I watch it with that same childlike enthusiasm I had when I was five or ten. Now, maybe this is what's happening for you in this program, because you went to summer camp, and maybe now you have a little brother or you have kids of your own going to conservation camp, and you get to relive it. You remember that fun. Gary Rogers teaches conservation education in schools around central Kentucky, and he is with me to talk about 
conservation camp and walk me through a day. Okay, first thing, when all the buses roll into camp, you're going to, everybody, all the campers all go in the air-conditioned cafeteria. We all sit in there, and the camp director, Mr. Coffey, will give you the layout of what's going to happen that week. He has like a PowerPoint presentation to tell you that everybody knows, even if you didn't see it in school, when I presented it in school, everybody knows what's going to happen, what the rules are, what you're going to learn all week long, and, and things like that. Then we'll divide you into cabins. And a lot of people are always worried, oh, I want to be in the cabin with my friend yeah it's no problem to be in the cabin with your friend as long as they're the same gender so <laughs> no, 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 let me ask you that is this co-ed camp it is co-ed it's usually half and half four cabins of boys four cabins of girls so we'll get i'll tell them at the end of orientation sit with the person you want to be in the cabin with if you have two or three friends or four you want to be in the cabin, we we'll sit in a little circle. So we'll go in and we'll start counting out little circles of numbers until we get to the magic number to fill up a cabin. Then we'll move on to the next cabin and fill up all the girl cabins. Then we'll count out the boys the same way, fill up the boy cabins. Then you go to your cabin. You get your name put on the roster. We collect up any medicine you might have brought to camp because a lot of kids have things they have to take. And it all goes up to the nurse's office. And if you need your medicine, you go to the nurse's office when that happens. And we make daily reminders, breakfast lunch, dinner, and bedtime to come to the office if it's your time of day to get your medicine. And we have a list of every camper and what they take. And if they don't show up, we'll hunt them down. Yeah. You, know, you didn't take your Ritalin. You didn't take your Claritin or whatever you're supposed to be taking that time of day. So we get all that straightened out in the cabin. You know, And we, uh, the counselor will tell them the rules. What's the toughest rule to uphold? I think the toughest rule to uphold is don't touch the air conditioner because I walk in some of those cabins, you could hang meat in those things and thinking, you know, leave it on 70 degrees, quit putting it down on 40. Cause once this is summer and it's going to be hot. It's hot and it's summertime, but there's a there's such a thing as too cold in the summer too. So, yeah, we'll, we'll do that cabin thing and play some get to know you games because some of the kids go to camp and they might be the only person from their school. Yeah. So we get all the kids in the cabin to be a little group. They're a little family for the week. Even though there's 200 eight campers in the camp, you only really interact with your 26 people most of the day. Your cabin, you have a schedule on the wall of all the activities you're going to do every day of the week and what time they happen. This, some people call it concentration camp instead of conservation camp because <laughs> we have to count the kids like 10 times a day to make sure everybody's where they're supposed to be before you send them off to do stuff. It's not a camp where you're running free, get to do whatever you want all day. It's like a school camp. You are supposed to be someplace most of the day. And in the evening at camp, you know, you have your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, of course. And you have playground time after lunch to play on the big playground and play soccer and basketball and kickball and things. Kickball is like the official game of Fish and Wildlife Camp. And in the evenings, you can pick and choose after supper what your favorite thing was. If you and your friends want to go play basketball, go do that. If you want to go fishing, go do that. If you want to go for a boat ride with the counselors and see some of Lake Cumberland, you can go do that. When it gets dark, we have outdoor activity every night. At Camp Wallace, we show movies outside on Monday and Tuesdays. On Wednesday and Thursday, we have the world's worst talent show. It's camper talent. And the campers sign up and burp the ABCs or play their arm pit or whatever (laughs) 10-year-old talent is. And then you go to bed after that about 10 o'clock and lights out is at 1030. You got a half hour to wash your hair, brush your teeth, take a shower, whatever you do before bed. In the morning, you get up with the radio at 730. Breakfast is 8 o'clock and we start over again learning more stuff. How many kids are campers in the summer? It's 10 weeks of camp, more or less, and um, you have 200 to 208 kids a week. Capacity is a little different depending on if it's Camp Webb or Camp Wallace or Camp Curry. I had seen somewhere a number of about 4,500 kids over the course of a summer over the course of three camps in Kentucky. Yeah, I'd say at least 4,500. Yeah, that's a lot of kids. You've been doing this for 70 years. Right. You've reached a lot of people. Is it, is it paying off? I think we still got people buying hunting and fishing licenses. There's still people that like to go and 
fish and hunt and shoot guns and do that stuff. So it's got to be helping. I mean, we're trying to make a new generation of sports people out there, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. I'd hate to see what would happen if we didn't exist and nobody taught these kids any outdoor skills anymore. It would be a generation of people playing thumb games. What do you need to bring with you to camp? Toothbrush? What else? All right. Well, you're going to need your own sleeping bag and a pillow for your bunk bed. You need your own soap, shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrush, deodorant for Pete's sakes. You need uh You should say that twice. If you're in the 4th, 5th, and 6th grade, you need to learn the wonders of deodorant. By Hell, have you mentioned deodorant? Should I bring that? It would be good to bring deodorant. Okay. Okay. Because I think some of these boys don't actually know that showers are something you're supposed to get into ever during a week. You also need to have your own shoes and socks and shorts and swimming clothes. Bring a towel for the pool. Bring a towel for the shower. Bring T-shirts. Bring a hat so the sun doesn't bake your little head. little sunscreen. Sunscreen, right? bug lotion. If you have any medicine you're supposed to take, bring it in the original container so we know what it is. All this is spelled out on a list you can it find online. It should be. It's on the application on the online. If you look it up online, it'll tell you that. So, Okay, so you're not going to bring your own shotgun. No, no. You won't be bringing your own uh, Genesis bow. Nuclear devices, your own bow. We have all the sporting equipment you need at camp already. You don't need to bring any of that. You can only bring one suitcase or one duffel bag on the U-Haul behind the bus. So mm-hmm. You want to bring the stuff you need, not stuff you don't need. Bring an extra pair of shoes in case you step in the lake or it rains and they get wet. You don't want to squish around in wet shoes all week. And bring a rain poncho because we have camp in the rain. If it's not lightning, we have camp in the rain. It's summertime. You're not going to freeze to death if it's raining. All right, Gary. Thanks a million. You're welcome. Thank you. Gary Rogers with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, one of my all-time favorite people that has ever walked the earth. If you would like to find out more about Summer Conservation Camp, it's pretty easy to do. You can log on to the Fish and Wildlife website. It's fw.ky.gov. We're out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Thank you.